You live outside of New York City? Yeah, yeah, we live an hour, hour and a half, depending on where you're going. Outside, up, up north. What's the drive like? Just highways. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, it's just, yeah, it's an hour, hour to, uh, to the Bronx, sort of, and then, you know, wherever you need to go, hour and a half to Brooklyn. It's quite surreal to say that, uh, you know, like, oh, I just drove drove into New York City to, to eat some Japanese food, right? Like, I, I can't imagine that kind of feeling. Just, you know, I live I live just outside one of the biggest cities in the world. It's just incredible. I mean, how is that for you? Do you enjoy it? Well, this is coming from, we used to be able to step outside our door and <laughs> eat, you know. I mean, I lived in New York for... I don't know, since 1990 until 2005. I mean, I lived in Brooklyn for 17 years. And then I went to university in New York, so a few years before that. So I was in New York for 20 years, you know. That's, and then coming up here, and then if you want a good Japanese meal, you got to get in the car and you got to drive for an hour and a half <laughs> and pay $40 to park the car and, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. But bit more of a you know, ritual, a bit more of an expensive yeah, we, sort of ritual. We don't do it all the time, you know. Um, it's a, kind of a pain in the ass, but it's there if you want it, you know, which is great. I'd, I'd, I'd rather live out here in the woods and have that there if I want it. I just want to say, um, you know, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to chat to us today. I want, I want to start the conversation with that because I really, really appreciate um you you joining us here on this chat today like cody and i are huge fans of um 12k and and, and you specifically it's interesting yeah, that you, you start talking about japan straight away because that's kind of you know where i'd love to start this whole conversation if we can like yeah that was not know. planned whatsoever <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was my my son wanted my son wanted to eat japanese we were going to eat at this french restaurant and it was too crowded and so he's like let's go have <laughs> japanese so we ended up yeah yeah so. <laughs> well it's kind of the thing that connects all of us because we're on we're all on opposite sides of the world you know the corners of the world uh, it's really there. wild i was thinking about that today i mean yeah. we're in three vastly different time zones about as different th you know completely spread out time zones like equidistant yeah. you know cody's it's, actually it's, tomorrow for for you and i Taylor. yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah it's wild but yeah like just about the japan thing like i guess what you know what took you to japan the first time you ever went there what was the connection there was it was in 2001, I guess. There was a label over there called Heads with a Z. Um, and this guy, Atsushi, and he sort of set up, you know, I don't know how it came about. He must have emailed me and said, hey, I'm, I'm so-and-so. Do you want to come over or something? I, you know, I don't remember how it kind of, like the initial seed, but he was the one who set up like a few shows and I went over with Richard Chartier and our friend and uh, label mate at the time, Jurgen, who recorded under the, under the name Sogar, um, who I'm still in touch with, uh, but he's not doing music anymore. Uh, every now and then I try to poke him to do something, but um, and without any, you know, real, didn't really know what to expect going over. And I just have a very vivid memory of, I don't know if it was before the first gig or probably after, or maybe the first night, anyway, being at a restaurant with three of us guys and a slew of, you know, organizers and you know, other people we didn't know in a country where we understood absolutely nothing that was so incredibly different. It felt, I felt so out of place, not in a bad, you know, not necessarily in a bad way. It's just like, wow, like this isn't my, 
this isn't my country, this isn't my world, you know. It's almost like I went like scuba diving once and I felt really out of place. Like this isn't I don't belong here underwater, you know. It was very strange, but it was like yeah, I just it was so surreal like like just spinning, you know, like didn't know what anyone was saying or what they were eating or it was just wild. Um, was it your first time in Asia? Yes. Yes. So quite a big culture shock. Yeah, it really was. And I was, you know, younger at the time. And um, yeah, I, but something must have happened in that trip that just made me completely fall in love with the place, you know. Um, because until the pandemic hit, you know, I've been back every year. And, um, you know, sometimes twice a year. And I have now not been back since 2017, which is really getting at me. Um, I went twice in 2017. So in 2018, I was kind of like, eh, I was just there in like November, you know, probably nothing. And then in 2019, my dad passed away. And then Sorry to hear that. the pandemic, you know, um, no, he passed away in the end of 20. 20 um but things were like not great and you know pandemic happened and here we are it's like been nearly five years and it's uh so you've never yeah. lived in japan is it just always a visiting no. relationship that you have with it yeah. yeah never lived there and do you remember like cody and i often talk about um or i often maybe it's just me i often talk about my first feeling as I stepped off the plane uh, in S South Korea is my first connection to Asia like I'd never been to Asia before I went to South Korea and I really viscerally remember stepping off the airplane for the first time and just like y you describe the, the restaurant scene like you know you don't understand anything around you, you don't understand the language or sort of the, the words that are displayed in front of you and I remember like that really affected me that first walk off off the plane down the ramp into the airport I was just like my head was just exploding absolutely yeah. culture shock I mean I don't remember that yeah I don't remember you know the plane you know it was probably I'm sure I'm sure it was like like that but for some reason it's that restaurant that you know, it was. I'd, I've been to enough countries where I don't speak the language that being around people who are speaking other languages is, I don't know, it, it doesn't bother me or not that it would bother, you know, it's just like I'm just used to it and like I learned to kind of just, you know, um, sit back and kind of not speak till I'm spoken to and like. It's, it just feels normal to have other languages going. So probably when I met like the guys off the plane, they spoke English. I don't know, it just seemed like a tour or like I'm getting off, you know, me, me getting met by someone. But again, I don't remember. It's the restaurant that, it, that I remember where it all hit me. You know, it's like, wow, this is crazy. Well, that's quite powerful. Yeah, it's, it's like another universe. And um, as I think that it's when that human connection, when you're, you're sitting right next to people and you, you sort of there's these sounds coming and there's this kind of feeling and almost the groundedness of it. Because when you, maybe when you're moving, you know, you're going to the location, it can feel like, you know, you're, you're on your way to somewhere. But when you finally sort of settle down and you're in a place like a where you're sitting down, you're, you're waiting, and then that's when it all catches up to you, perhaps. Yeah, or, or you're tired. You're getting off the plane. you got to go. you got to get your bags. you got to do this. you got to do that, you know. And then finally, yeah, you're relaxed, and you're at the meal, and you can actually think for a second where you, where you actually are. And it's like, yeah. And the food, I remember the food being so strange because, you know, Japanese food in America is not like... Japanese food in Japan unless you go to a good place in New York City where you know the place we were at today is very authentic you know but like you know at the time I didn't like any place you go to you know you have an Americanized version of 
Mexican food or Indian food or and it's always different when you go to the you know go to the actual place and there's and this this was in Tokyo the, the, this um, this first journey? yeah yeah this would have been Tokyo you know for whatever reason I just fell in love with the place and as soon as we left said I'm, I'm going back next year and it's just you know met so many friends and you know uh, one of my best friends if not my best friend lives in Tokyo now and did you find that your time just this, this first journey and and spending more time there over the years did you find that that affected your practice and and I guess in terms of inspiration and wh- where you took your music was there an influence there yeah I, th- I think so and you know I remember people I remember people when I was there telling me and maybe they were just being nice but they were you know they said you know you're there's something very Japanese about you, you know, and, and, and I guess it's probably partially why I fell in love with it is just cause I got it so well, you know, I just, it just clicked with me. So there just must be, you know, attention to detail, you know, they have such a great attention to detail and appreciation of certain, you know, certain kinds of things. I don't know. Maybe it's just sort of something that I felt, comfortable with and the multiple times I went back and the first time I might have felt like I don't belong and felt like a stranger every other time it really felt you know like home it felt completely natural whereas if I go to like Germany or something or Europe I really do feel like an edge like something a little edgy there that I you know like I feel like a even though in Japan I'm I clearly look like a tourist you know i don't i don't feel like one where in europe i could blend in but i feel more you know out of place yeah it's a connection to the place and the ideas and and that way of living and i think maybe all three of us have felt that in in different ways over the years um and and that sort of it was a destination for us to go to and i can say for myself certainly that Going to Japan uh, activated, I think, a lot of creative uh, potential and ideas I didn't know I had within myself. Um, right. You know, leaving uh, little, little old New Zealand behind and arriving in this place and letting that wash over me. And so it, it seems to be this kind of destination that attracts a lot of people. And whether it's an active thing or, seren- you know, through serendipity that people arrive there and it, it leads their life on these new, these new paths, um, I think there's something quite special about it. Yeah, I mean, I th- I think everyone probably, everyone who's fortunate enough to travel to different places, you know, often ends up finding a connection to some place for some reason or another. You know, um, I know a lot of artists and stuff end up in Berlin. You know, there must be, I mean, Berlin's, you know, must be incredibly inspirational and alive, you know, and there's just, that attracts certain kind of people and travel is important and i think that's often a theme that simon and i come back to is how over these last few years and still with new zealand where you know we've got a lot of restrictions here that that idea of travel and just being able to hop on an airplane and go somewhere if you have the means to do that uh, has been limited and it's it's really affected i think in in a wider way the arts and just the way people create because it's been very i think very lonely for a lot of people globally you know it's funny because i travel always really stresses me out you know the whole like flying and getting ready and you're tired and stuff like that so you know there was something about the pandemic that made that kind of nice just to be a homebody for a little bit but at this point you know i really feel the um i really really miss traveling you know are you planning on going back to Japan at all anytime soon? We had a plan. We didn't have solid dates, but we were we had cities picked out and a couple of promoters lined up for last like 2021 spring. And we quickly realized that wasn't going to happen, so we said let's try it for like October November of last year. And clearly that wasn't going to happen. But I think the um, I'm pretty sure to go over there now, you still need to sit in a quarantine hotel for a week or something. 
Yeah, it's um, so. There's there, there is a law on on tourists coming in. I think uh, unless you have a connection to Japan with like family or, or something like that, you you can't right. get in right now. They are easing things though. I think very soon they're going to um, they're going to ease up. Yeah, I mean, as soon as they do, then I'm on a plane. So you know, we've got places we can go that are kind of ready to host some shows. So it's just a matter of. You know, it's really hard. It's hard to think more than a week, a week ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we think about your connection to Japan, like, you know, obviously sound plays a massive part in your life and, and a massive role in your life. Like, can you talk about what the sound of Japan is for you? Like, what do you remember about the sound of Japan? I mean, in a real literal sense, the crows every morning at like four in the morning when the sun comes up. <laughs> that <laughs> wake me up every morning is the sound of japan whenever i hear a crow it reminds me of there's a certain sound of the crows over there that and they always wake me up really early um but you know i mean in terms of i mean if you're talking like musical sound you know i don't know if i can do it real any justice with words or anything i mean there's i've released enough music from from Japanese artists that like that I, I can hear a connection or sometimes when I hear something that I of someone I don't know to me it'll I'll be like oh, it sounds like Japanese and sure enough it is you know I'm talking like electronic kind of music um, you know there's a certain there's a certain way the melodies are it may be you know I don't I don't want to say playful, but maybe like sprightly or there's something like, I don't know. Uh, there's things I hear sometimes that to me, like run, run through a lot of different artists, but I mean, there's also mm. so many, you know, that's, you know, a generalization. There's obviously, you know, so many different kinds of. Have you spent much time in the countryside? Not a lot. Like, um, I mean, a few trips, it's like, you know, it's usually like Shinkansen and city to city. There's been a couple times. Yeah. You know, look at like, Ooh, I want to go there. You know, I want to go there <laughs> as it speeds by you. But there's been, um, in 2015 or something like that, we took, went to a place on like this South, place called kumano and we were there with stefan mathieu and federico durand and we and we rented these houses in this like like little like vacation it was off season so there was like these vacation houses by this ocean and mountain that were not being used and i wasn't involved in the rental but you know our friend tomo set it all up and got these houses and we stayed there for a few days and hiked in the woods and down to the beach and um in fact the on the 12k website in the part about the 12 principles there's a picture of a bunch mm -hmm. of us on a beach and that's in kumano in japan um and we did a lot of filming and stuff like that and it was cherry blossoms season um and it was really incredible i just had a look it's mia mia prefecture i believe so it's sort of okay yeah just south of osaka so kind of yeah so, sort of yeah towards for the south yeah toward the water from i thought it was osaka or uh, kyoto but it's further than kyoto um that was great that was like a really you know time away from the cities and then one of the last times i went we went to uh Teshima and Naoshima, the islands of, you know, the art islands. And I mean, it's not countryside, but these are small, you know, fairly small towns on these islands. And we just were there for a few days with bicycles and just biked everywhere. And, you know, it was, it was nice. But, you know, in terms of real out in the country, country, uh, not not too mm -hmm. much like in the middle of nowhere i really want to go to um like hokkaido in the deep winter 
you know, and just like head out into the, you know, 40 feet of snow and take pictures. <laughs> Hokkaido is quite phenomenal. I, um, I spent a bit of time up there. It reminds me a lot of New Zealand, actually. Uh, but I was in a place mm. called Akan doing a photo shoot project and uh, norm, norm, normally people don't get access to it. It's, it's a, an old lake and there's a, a dormant volcano there. And we got, we got access to one of the, the smaller lakes, which is usually blocked off from the public. And seeing just how clear the water was um, going out mm -hmm. on the lake, mm -hmm. um, this kind of ancient uh, primordial forest, um, there were deer walking around and, and that sort of thing. And seeing that and then contrasting that with where we, we had come from just a few days earlier in the middle of Tokyo, this kind of concrete jungle. Um, so that contrast was, was really quite powerful. And at that time, I think I was also quite homesick. And so coming to a place that reminded me a lot more of New Zealand. Um, sure. There, there was yeah. something about that. Yeah. And, and almost spiritual as well, because you might be aware up in Hokkaido, there's the Ainu people who sort of originally inhabited that area. And so they've got a lot of yeah. mytholo mythology, sort of their you know, connection with nature and the bears and the deer and the different animals. And it's it's sort of not really sort of that that well known, I think, for a lot of people. But that connection, that kind of animalism, um, you you can feel that. And and I think you can you can only sort of really understand that when you go to the countryside in Japan. That sort of the sounds of the temples and the shrines and the forests and all of that, which for me, like that's that's the sound. Everything else is you know the sounds of Tokyo are sort of a lot more mechanical, but they're they're, they're sort of almost less human. Than what you find in the forest. Yeah, I, I remember like really the first time I ever heard a bamboo forest was like the bamboo just kind of clacking against each other. You know, it was just really amazing. Um, you know, it was doing it by itself in the wind, and it was it was just wild. You know, I do have some video of a bamboo forest on some hard drive somewhere. Um, but yeah, that sound is really, you know, pretty mm. great. Haunting almost though. Gorgeous yeah. and haunting. Do you, um, do you write a lot of music when you're in Japan? Like, cause you go there with Marcus Fisher and Corey Fuller, I think you went with, right? You did some trips together. Um, yeah, Corey lives there. So yeah. Right. Okay. So he lives yeah. in Tokyo, is it? Yeah, he lives, he lives in Tokyo. He was kind of raised in Japan. So he's been through all the school system there and left for college and then came back with his family. So, um, yeah, he lives there. Yeah. And do you write together when, when you're there or do you prefer to be sort of like a tourist and look around and see the nature? No, I mean the, the problem with the problem with these trips and it, it's the same as with the ability to get out and see nature is that, I'm there for like 10 days and we have to do a certain number of gigs, you know, and it's like you have, you know, it's just kind of, you have to kind of go city to city. And if I go alone without anyone else, I like to do less gigs. I, you know, I could, I'd be perfectly happy if I didn't do any, you know, I just want to <laughs> see Corey and, and go places. Um, but we are kind of rushed and, the last few times I went, we try to do less gigs and have more free time, you know. Um, and I'd love at some point just to go over, you know, for no, you know, without any musical equipment and, you know, just go be a tourist for a little bit. Um, but we don't, so we don't have a lot of time to write music, you know, and, but music has been written, you know, it's like um, we released the, album between like back in 2013 or 14 or 15 or something and that was you know just kind of like an improv session so we, we have like time to do like improv sessions you know at like a venue or something the day before or after the gig um you know setting up and jamming sort of but you know to actual sit down like in the studio and spend time and write um have not done that i'd like to come back to this idea of the 12 principles so we're talking about um this photo of um of uh kumano and the the, the beach and the ocean and that kind mm -hmm. of moment that seems to have left a quite an impression on, on yourself 
Um, but one thing that Simon and I both um, were very interested in um, was this w- w- with 12K uh, was also the, these principles that sort of went into it. Um, this is something that we often talk about, you know, with kind of creating a, a culture and a, and a practice between different artists, um, you know, th- across the world, how we can align ourselves with something that is you know, able to bring us together. And I'd love to hear the story and the background of how these, these 12 principles evolved for your, um, uh, for 12K and, and what sort of went into developing that. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, if we want to touch on each one, yeah, um, we could do that. Because how, I mean, it's funny because how they evolved or what went into it, I don't remember. And they didn't evolve except for like a half hour of writing them down like 20 years ago or whatever, you know, it wasn't, which I really like them. And after when I wrote them, it just, I think it was just something that kind of came to me and like, Oh, this is kind of interesting. And this is kind of how I want the label to be. But I didn't think that 25 years down the line, they would all like completely still resonate and like be, you know, be true you know i don't know if they if the fact of writing them down kind of made me adhere to them you know it's just like it it, i'm kind of i really like that about those that they that they're i'm still sticking to them without really even trying you know it's just kind of like so don't tell listeners what they want to hear let them discover that for themselves yeah that that that's the first one, right? Yes. That was probably the first one because I had just um, quit working at a record label um, in New York City, Instinct Records, who I had early recordings with, and I was the art director there. And it was a pretty small company. You know, we were all in one big sort of loft, and um, it working there really taught me i I wanted to start a small label and working there taught me how not to run a label um as much as i enjoyed working there and everyone was great you know it was definitely a much more commercial venture and in a lot of ways it was all about just hitting people over the head with your releases and like you know advertise advertise shove it in people's faces this is what you want this is the latest and greatest you know and it's like i don't want to do that you know like maybe you do that and you have like some like flavor of the month kind of thing and everyone loves it and then moves on, but there's no lasting value in that, you know? So to me, all the things that I've just, all the things I really love in my life are things that I've discovered, you know, myself or, I mean, or through a friend or something, but you know, things that you come upon, not that are like forced on you. Um, and that's that was just really like like okay number one this is how i'm kind of going to do the label you know it seems Um, like number one and number two are sort of connected because the second one here is treat your audience as they are intelligent passionate lovers of art and sound and so by giving that respect and sort of appreciating the audience that you can allow them give them that space to discover and and not sort of put it on on rails and say this is what it needs to be yeah yeah exactly and you know, it's a it's not a very commercial way to, to run a label, but you know, it was never supposed to be a commercially successful thing anyway. And I'm sure that most of the labels that that we all like and enjoy are similar in terms of their you know, I don't think I'm it's anything new or anything, um, but it's just kind of. I'm actually. I yeah. think I've I've noticed something. I'm just looking at these now, Taylor, and and I feel like they're they're, they're sort of couplets because number one and number two go together, but also three and four. So we've got evolve constantly but slowly, but also stay quiet, stay small. For me, that seems like that's a little bit connected. Um, but that that idea of sort of staying staying humble, staying quiet, staying small. I mean, is that t- tell us a bit more about that? Like, how did? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that was again like. I never wanted, um, I never wanted it to be like a big business or like to eat up all my time or have have to make a certain amount of money to do you know then to. I never wanted it to be about the money, right? So 
um, because as soon as it is, then you're, then you've got different things you need to do and, you know, um, different changes, goals and questions yeah, to answer it everything. Yeah. So just, you know, I was like, if I just keep, and plus it, it, I'm sure it puts more stress and maybe it would have petered out, you know, long ago if it, if I was, had a room full of people and trying to keep people employed and, and this and that, I mean, who knows, you know, I, I um, it, it's not going to doing the kind of music it, I release. It's, it's not going to be big or commercially successful. I knew that from day one and it's, that's fine. That's, you know, it's not, that's not the point. So just staying small is I'd rather, I'd rather be in it for the long haul. Right. than be like the trendiest label, you know? Yeah. Well, that's the timelessness as well. Like, I don't know, some creating work, creating your life's work. And I, I think we all right. maybe can agree that we live in strange times in a strange world where certain things are promoted as being, you know, the, the now and, and where things are at. But really there is a timelessness that we can return to, um, and with art and film and, and all these different mediums, looking at them, they they are timeless. I mean, I just watched um, Tokyo Story the other day, and it's from like 19, 1952 or something, and it's as timeless and as important and relevant then as it is now. You know, this right. kind of the busy, the people too busy to look after what's important, um, and and that timelessness of, of something like that, that simplicity of it, I think we can all. You know, we're all attracted to that uh, in different ways. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with you know whatever's trendy or what you know. I mean, there's lots of great stuff that comes and goes, and it's flavor of the week. And you know, I listen to a lot of you know popular music, but um, you know, it's just not what I wanted to do for the label, and it's not. Yeah, I don't know. Just want to create something that I don't know has some kind of importance or something. You know, or at least, yeah, like you said, my life's work, you know, any of our life's work. There's something that we know that we must do and, you, you know, go through the layers. And I mean, I think we're all, all three of us have been through that where, you know, you're sort of starting out and you're, you're working through creating work and, and trying to um, tell a story or, or, you know, pleasing people and, and doing all that sort of thing. But you, 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 you arrive at a destination or at, at a point where you, you suddenly realise there's this, this, this much further, that there's a lot more ahead of you and to carry on on that and on that path you need to just tell the story that's inside and kind of get that out and um yeah it's questions of beauty questions of truth um it kind of it's, uh, it's something you can never quite achieve um but expressing what what it is you must do yeah yeah i hope i never achieve you know <laughs> achieve the end or it's like what's you know there's no point i, I don't want to ever reach the end of what i'm trying to do yeah. you know um but yeah it takes a long time to you know i think it takes you know early in your musical career at least for me you know you're imitating your favorites and it takes a while to to mature and grow up and to create your own voice and you know eventually you find it and was there was there some key moments for you where you you you, you, you sort of these steps where you realized you had you had sort of developed and matured that the work and, and you could look back and say, oh, that's where I was and this is where I am now. Like, was there sort of events that happened that led you on that journey? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was always like, um, ever since like, my best friend in high school who I started doing music with when we each bought our first synthesizer, um, we didn't know each other until we realized we both had like synths and we're like, oh, maybe we should get together and like he played me Brian Eno's Thursday afternoon in 1985 and which is to this day my favorite piece of music of all time and um my whole career has probably been trying to rip off that record but um I just love that was hearing that hearing that then as a high schooler it was you know I was a teenager of the 80s and listening to all the great stuff in the eighties. And this was unlike any of it. And it, I loved it. I don't, I didn't understand at the time how much it would affect me or change my path, you know, but having that, knowing that that music existed 
like this single 61 minute piece of like quietude. Um, and then as I, but I was still like into industrial music and making industrial music and, you know, that morphed into techno and doing a lot of techno and playing a lot of gigs. And then in the late nineties, realizing that this lifestyle is not for me, like these kids are here probably more for the drugs than they are for the music. And it's, it's, this isn't my scene anymore. It's like, I'm getting too old, you know, and I was like young twenties or something like this, but like, it just felt like it was, um, and I had this like under, you know, the stuff going on underneath that was more like, you know, ambient techno and stuff like that. And I was, I was like, I think I'm done with this like rave stuff. I'm going to concentrate, you know, that was a real key moment. So it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I do often feel there's this kind of two modes of, of, of music and often, um, you know, as you mentioned, that sort of drug culture and, um, the, the sound and, and the space and, and all of that uh, that's sort of one but then there's also this this kind of organic humanism that is very rare to find this kind of the shapes and, and I think Brian Eno and, and there are other artists out there who are who have kind of capturing that this kind of almost like the sounds of nature but that there's, there's something very organic and flowing and, and it's this sort of um, I mean indescribable really um, but it's it's utterly human and utterly beautiful and you can just sort of let yourself drift away and i for myself i, I listening to thursday afternoon sitting uh, you know lying on my balcony in tokyo watching the sky sort of summer skies drift past and you almost can just float away with the clouds as well and um there's something about that which if, you know listening to that for the first time and, and getting exposed to that and realizing this is a new way of um this is a new kind of music for, you know, there's, there must be something quite beautiful about that yeah, it was in my friend at the time, he, cause like I'd go to his house on the weekend and spend the night. Um, and we'd be making music like all night, but when it was time for bed, he'd put on Thursday afternoon in the CD player and he'd hit the CD player on repeat. So it would play all through the night and we'd wake up to it. And because the piece sounds the same pretty much for the entire thing, you don't know where you are in the, you know, and it's, it's a really weird feeling to fall asleep and wake up to the same piece of music. Um, and that was something that we always did. So it would just be on for hours and hours while we slept and it would greet us in the morning. But I mean, that music, that piece of music is just, is just so influential to me and the, the length of it as well, you know, um, do, do, do you think it was influential to you because it was such a juxtaposition to what you were listening to or making at the time? You, you mentioned that you were making like industrial music. Is is Thursday Afternoon so influential because it was so unique? Or were you listening to other kind of ambient records? No, I can't. I mean, at that time in 85, I was listening to New Order and it wasn't quite industrial yet. I wasn't into the, like the early industrial stuff. I mean, maybe a little bit like throbbing gristle kind of stuff. I was into more like the, the skinny puppies and things like that. So in the mid eighties, it was new order and early OMD and, you know, the cure and all that stuff. So Cocteau twins, you know, Cocteau twins, not really, don't really sound like, Eno, but you know, obviously there's something, um, you know, kind of magical about them. So a lot of Cocteau Twins and, well, you know, I don't know, This Mortal Coil, all that kind of 4AD stuff. I don't think they called it ambient then, but, you know, there was definitely something to it. So, you know, the, I don't, the Eno piece didn't strike me as, I don't remember it striking me as weird or anything. I mean, it, I immediately liked it, you know, but I, I really think part of it was the length, you know, like, wow, this is, this is doing like nothing for 61 minutes. You know, the song goes nowhere. It slows you down. And, yeah. and that is the most, you know, that's basically the template for my music is, you know, music that just goes nowhere. And that's the point. And that's the, you know, what's so nice about it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just kind of dropped in and you're forced to have a start and an end because, 
you know cds and lps and computer files do but you know the point is just to sort of insert yourself into this world and and you know find your own way in and out of it um so it was really the length that that struck me as like wow like this is really cool there's, there's this kind of idea in literature in, in latin they say in media res we're sort of in the middle of the story and um, there is something about these longer pieces, these me- meandering pieces that take you along this kind of mountain stream of, of music. And often Simon and I talk about how, you know, where the world is at today with TikTok and, and all these apps and things that people are doing and how our time has become very atomized and, and a very short attention span. Um, and that you know even 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 only a few years ago that that was different but today you know we've got such atomized units of time units of music um that it's it's hard for people to sit down and listen to something like that or the disintegration tapes or or any you know like a soundtrack of 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 a film that sort of thing um it's very rare to to, for people to make the time to do that and and i feel like that's reflected in the way a, a lot of the world is going today where everything is sort of now it's very worrisome i think you know um you know without trying to sound like an old man or anything i mean it's yeah the attention spans are you know it's problematic i think getting shorter and shorter but um can like like you you mentioned that you you know you used to listen to records as you sleep like the brian eno example uh, you used to yeah, still do records. every night yeah. It's so lovely. I love I love the idea so much. And it sort of makes me wonder how you want your listeners to experience your music. Do you have any ideas about like what kind of situation your listeners should be in when they're listening to your music, for example? Or twelve K yeah, music it's, in general? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I mean unfortunately I can't listen to my own music because I don't like it. So <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of a it's a very it's something i struggle with constantly i mean it's 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 a very strange thing to devote your something devote your life to something that you don't really like you know and that's being kind of comical or general about it but i'm so um hard on myself and i really enjoy the creative process and at some point during that process, I'm like, wow, this is really nice. This is really cool. As the album writing gets near the end, I can't stand to listen to it anymore. I'm sure many artists are like this. You know, you get tired of it or I just, all I hear is the mistakes and the problems and I should do this, I should do that. And eventually I just have to like cut, cut it and say, this is it, it's done. You know, I'm just going to keep hating it more. You know, so, and it usually takes me about four years to listen to one of my own recordings from the day of the release. Um, And, but getting back to your, this does lead into your question. It's especially in the later stages of creating my music, definitely mixing my own music because the mixing stage happens, you know, separately, uh, you know, like at one time separately from, you know, potentially weeks or months or years of writing a piece um, in the the mixing and mastering stages, I can only do at night. Um, I don't think my music sounds very good during the daytime. And I can listen. I found many times that when I'm mixing, when an album's done and I'm mixing it or I'm doing the master, that if I do it in the daytime, I really don't like it and start getting frustrated and like ready to can the record. If I listen to it at night, it's like I can take it. So I don't want to tell any listeners when, when or where to listen to anything, but I, you know, I think my music sounds better at night. Um, That's fascinating. You know, And, and I really, I really resonate with that a lot. I mean, I, I, I probably a lot of ambient music does, but I, you know, when I'm doing non-musical stuff in the studio, I'll put on all kinds of music at all hours of the day. I don't just listen to ambient stuff at night, you know. Um, but 
I don't know what it is with my music that that I only like it at night. Um, but it is it is frustrating that that I can't really enjoy what I make, you know. Um, and God, you know, certainly never listen to it. If if I happen to be listening to some mix or playlist that has one of my songs on it, I skip it as soon as it comes. Um, and I'm sure this is. I mean, I, I know a lot of friends who are the same way but you know um yeah you know because i'll just instantly compare it to what came before what came after and you know you know i'm listening not only for the music but i'm i hear so many technical details and you know i know everything that went into it every instrument i used and i remember making it but four or five years later ten years later i don't remember how i made it Right. So I'll listen to a piece of music and it's finally, it's finally like listening to someone else's music. Cause I don't remember the gear that I had at the time that went into it. And I could, I'm finally stepped away from it enough where I'm like, all right, this isn't bad. This, you know, like I just re released this thing on Bandcamp called the inland sea. I don't know if you guys saw that. It's a piece of music from 2013 and I haven't listened to it since 2013. So it's 10 years um since i heard it and i i wanted to listen to it to make sure that it didn't suck before i put it on Bandcamp, and i was like oh this is actually kind of nice i don't remember whatsoever how i made that you know and i was like it seems pretty cool so i put it up you know there's sort of two aspects to that one perhaps is um and being myself being not not particularly um uh, musically uh, uh, technical or talented, I, I don't necessarily hear the mistakes that maybe someone who's who's got skills in that in that space would would, would hear. Um, but maybe with with this uh, release that you just mentioned, it's so long ago that yourself maybe you've moved on from say who you were at that point in your life, and so it is in fact sort of listening to someone else's music in a way. Yeah, I mean you do risk like like forget listening to like the other extreme is listening to music that's so old that it was a different you. Mm. you know and it's like oh that's not me anymore that's like complete rubbish you know that's or that's embarrassing or you know <laughs> um so there is that you know you can go too far when it's uh you know there is a piece of music that i did with my high school friend i think we did it in 1988 that i still think is one of the most coolest things i've ever written and no one has ever heard it except me and him um, and it's been like, you know, coming on 40 years or something. Well, it's the, it's the um, nostalgia, you know, you associate, you know, that such formative periods. Um, and often yeah, think absolutely. That. Yeah. All that music that we did together is so important to me Those days. and to him too. And no one's ever heard it. Mm. I have no intention of anyone ever hearing it. It's somehow, you know, we weren't trying to like release stuff or anything like that you know we we're just doing it and learn it was such a learning process you know it's like oh we each have one synthesizer what can we do yeah you know That's um, f- foundational you know foundational and work. it was just yeah it was like one piece of gear and it's just been like a constant ramp up to where i am now in terms of technical you know knowledge and stuff like that just learning completely organically well, I wonder if some some of your like you, you're quite critical, as you say, about your music, but maybe some of that comes from because you are a mixing and mastering engineer, so you are so honed in on the individual sounds themselves. Oh, it's terrible. These, um, yeah, it's like when you learn about film, right? Oh, sure. Anything that you're really knowledgeable about, you're 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 going to pick up on things that your average enjoyer of that thing it doesn't matter they're not gonna you know but i'll listen to music i've 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 lightly remastered like random songs in my itunes library because from random artists because they bought some frequency bothers me you know and it's like you you get to a point where you and i'm sure filmmakers are the same way where you, you just can't i can't listen to a piece of music just for what it is just enjoy you know, it's, you know, that ship has long sailed for me. And, you know, I can't undo the, the technical, the way I listen to music technically. 
you know, I was in the car with my wife like a couple months ago and we were listening to something or other. I forgot what it was. Radiohead or something. Or the Beatles. I don't know what it was. And I was like, do you hear that snare sound? I was like, that is the most incredible snare. Like the the brush, the room, like she's like, no. She's like, that's fine, whatever. It's cool. I was like, no, like, you know, that snare makes this whole song. And it's and that's just the difference, you know, again, like with someone who makes movies, it's probably the same way. Like, you see that camera they're using, that angle, and, you know, I can just enjoy watching a movie and, you know, because I don't know anything about what goes into them, really. But the poor movie makers probably can't watch a movie the same way. Well, they've they've crafted it to have a certain effect, and um, for non-technical people, it comes across and it just the effect uh, plants itself. But people who are able to decode that will know what's going on. So you almost have to turn that turn that mind off sometimes to 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 just sit down. Yeah, but it is right. Which which I don't think I can. Yeah, I don't think I could do anymore. And it also, you know, a lot of a lot of mixing engineer. There's kind of a one of the things I like to think about when mixing music is the ov- like you just said is the overall effect right like you're going for you're trying to convey a feeling or a story and you can spend all day tweaking that snare drum but does it re- does that snare drum really matter in this song maybe it does you know but there's a good chance it doesn't and like don't spend 24 hours on that snare drum like beating yourself up over it because it doesn't affect the big picture, you know, and I think it's hard as a, with infinite possibilities in the studio, it's really hard to know when to stop. And, yeah. You know. Well, that, that big picture is really important. And I think, um, you know, for myself as a visual artist, um, the, the thing that I often come back to is a theme of nostalgia. That's really, I think, a, a primal kind of what drives a lot of my work. And that always looking at the big effect, that's what, what, what I'm looking for. But with your music, do you think there's a certain feeling or nuance or, or big idea that connects that you're trying to sort of chip away at, at with, with your music, something that you're trying to talk to um, as, as a feeling or emotion? I mean, you know, on one level, I just write what I write, and it's kind of just what I have to do, you know. And I do it on some level for no particular reason, except it's just what I do. Um, but going back to what you said about slowing time down, I mean, I've mentioned that a lot over the years about, and it's one of the reasons I got into writing much more quiet ambient music when I lived in Brooklyn is just trying to create a little bit of you know, peace in a really crazy world. And I think now is more important than ever to do that. Um, yes. So I think if there's, you know, one thing I can say that my music would be about, it would be about that, about just slowing down a little bit and learning, you know, learning a longer attention span or just being happy you know, being happy with not everything going on around, you know, not everything needs to go on at the same time, you know. Um, So that's really core to almost everything I do. But, you know, there's other things like nature themes and, and, um, you know, I'm I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that people get a a certain sense of fragility in my music, you know, and I I like to... um, I find my, I like there to be a certain sense of tension in my music, which is kind of goes against, you know, a little bit of the quote unquote ambient thing, but there's that tension where something's about to break and you're not quite sure if it's going to break or not. And it usually never does in my music, you know? Um, And so there's that kind of natural tension of, something being fragile and you know you kind of need to tiptoe around it a little bit so it doesn't break and maybe it'll break and maybe it won't it's kind of there's something you know there's something there it's not just 
you know, it's not new age music. I think that's kind of what separates new age from what we call ambient music. And I'm not a, I don't know a lot about new age music except for hearing it from time to time. But it seems to me that it's at least back, you know, in the eighties or whatever, it was very much a, a more one dimensional, you know, there wasn't a lot of risk in it. There wasn't a lot of, um, tension i don't know i mean i understand that yeah you know like just straight you know strangeness i don't know things things about to fall apart and fail you know but they don't well there's a there's a zeitgeist that we live in and the world does seem very very topsy-turvy and you know what, what's going on and then potentially you know early in the earlier days it, it could be just this sort of raw optimism this kind of raw nature sound but where we are at today you know there is this con this contest between well what does the future look like what does it sound like what is um you know wh where are we going to be in 10 years um, yeah and that's kind of that delicate um fragility that you talk about um one question I did want to sort of circle back to a little bit, uh, Taylor, was this kind of question of community. And you mentioned this sort of quite formative relationship you had uh, in high school with your friend where you were able to create music together and you both had synths and, and that sort of thing. Where, where you're at today, and again with, with 12K, you know, this, this community of artists and, and people, both physical and I guess people all over the world, um, to, you know, I'd be interested just to, not, to understand a little bit more about that sort of your process, collaboration, um, working with other people, how important that is to you, um, and 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 how that's affected you, I guess. Yeah, it's it's extremely important to me. I mean, I realized pretty early on when I would tour, and especially going back to places like Japan so many times, is that for me these trips were really just about the people and the gigs were a vehicle to get to these people and to make these connections and these friends. Um, and I, I don't always really enjoy playing live that much. Um, sometimes I really do. Sometimes I really don't, but the, you know, these travels were a way, to make these connections and to make these friends and and yeah like i said i i realized that really quickly that that's really what i loved about traveling and having a label as well and it's like all the i mean to me it's like you know as corny as it sounds it's 12k is like a family you know and it's for the most part everyone involved in the label are friends with each other i mean that, that's true in a lot of labels i guess it's a relatively small community around the world but you know these are people that we spend time together and we you know travel together and eat together and and uh make music together and it's just to me that's what it's about you know and the collaborating uh musically is so important because i think we all learn so much from each other you know, when you collaborate, you, um, I also enjoy my collaborative. I can actually listen to my collaborative releases, which I, um, and I think it's just cause someone else is there and they like it and you like it. So it must be okay. Right. If it was terrible, someone would say something less pressure when you're working by yourself. There's no one, yeah, there's no one there to tell you it's terrible. So you have to just, trust yourself or not so when you're working with someone um you can bounce ideas and oh that's that's bad let's not do that let's do this and in the end you've come up with something that you both like and if you both like it then maybe there's something to it you know um so for me it's easier to listen to that stuff but i learn you know it's just i love the last few years, you know, for obvious reasons, my collaborations have mostly been remote, but I really make an attempt to do, and I've done a lot of collaborative releases to make, to make them in person, you know, as much as possible. At least the initial ideas, if editing needs to be done separately afterwards or something, but to be in the room with someone, um, 
and creating this, you know, Marcus Fisher comes here a lot and my studio is a complete mess when he's here and we got tape loops running all around the room and the gear is all in different weird places. And that's so great because, you know, you're, it breaks me out of what I'm used to doing. Oh, this, this is always over here. I always do this with that. And I always do this with that. And, you know, someone comes over and they're like, well, why don't we put that there and let's do this with that. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? It's like, that one goes over there. And I was like, no, no, just trust me. And, you know, so that kind of thing. It's like, you just, you get broken out of what your, your comfort zone a little bit. And yeah, break, break the routine of your writing. Yeah. Mm, it is important. Yeah, and I love yeah, that, absolutely. you know, um, I wonder if I could just ask you about uh, your relationship with building community in New York, because you know, being such a big city as it is, you can sort—I I imagine um, you can experience New York as a very lonely place, or you can experience it as a very, you know, communal and sort of like a, a place where you can make connections with everybody. Um, and and what was your experience when you were living in the? Bronx? Did you say you were living in the, in the Brooklyn? Bronx? In okay. Brooklyn. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it was one of loneliness. Um, right. I had I had a real problem with the like experimental, you know, electronic ambient music scene in New York, uh, mostly in New York in Manhattan at at the time. Um, because I felt like it was all these separate little cliques, right? It was like going back to high school and you had these group of people and they did that thing and they didn't help out anyone else and they didn't care what anyone else was doing and all their people would go to their shows. And then like we had our little thing and no communication with anyone else. I didn't even really have a thing. That was the thing. It's like, I had the label, but I had no, I had no artists in New York, you know, the artists were all in other places. So, you know, I felt, and I knew some of the other people and I was friendly with them, but it wasn't like this. It's like, if you were from a different crew, you know, you're kind of on your own. And that really bothered me, you know, and there wasn't a lot of cross pollination or help um that i felt maybe, maybe people hated what i did and that was why i mean i have no idea but you know it was like um there was a venue called tonic in new york that was kind of the center of a lot of this stuff and that was really the best community hub you know and those were the shows that would bring out the most various varying groups of people but when they did their own smaller things, it was really kind of insular and and not a lot of community feeling. So you built that yourself sort of thing. You built that community feeling. Yeah. So it, it bothered me when I was there. Like I remember like the, the music store, Other Music, which you guys have maybe heard of or just it was a fantastic, famous music store in New York. And there's a, a long time that they didn't give 12 K like the time of day. It's like, come on guys. I'm like, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I've got this label. I'm in New York. Uh, you know, at the time there wasn't a lot of labels like mine in New York. It's like, and I don't know, they just didn't care. You know, I wasn't the right kind of thing for them or whatever, you know? And it's like, um, and I guess everyone has, you can't blame them for having their thing or whatever, but I just figured there'd be a little more like, uh, give and take and, and, you know, trying to help, you know, trying to get these tiny little things, some support in there. I just really didn't feel it. So I, yeah, felt like I just had to create my own, um, my own family outside the New York borders. Cause really I had no, uh, artist friends, or on the label that were in New York at the time. It's interest, interesting you mentioned that because before um, we, we caught up today, I was, I was having a chat with Simon about 
you know, he's, he's in London at the moment and around that kind of uh, moving to a city and, and kind of re- reconnecting with people. And for myself, you know, I was in Tokyo as well. And I often felt this great sense of loneliness and, and amongst 20 million people actually being an island, you know, all mm-hmm. on my own. And then I, in the last two years, I've moved back to New Zealand and Wellington, which is, you know, a couple of hundred thousand people, a tiny little city. And um, I've got a lot more connection here um, than I ever did in Tokyo. And it's so strange because you expect it to be the opposite. Um, and throughout the, this whole um, pandemic period, connecting with those kindred spirits across the world um, through Zoom and, and whatnot um, has proven to be quite effective. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, with places that are so big, it's there's so many choices and options that it's hard to get everyone, you know, everyone you can really hone in on the exact thing that you like. And um, maybe if you're in a place that has less options, you have to compromise and you have to go to their show because it's kind of all there is and it's great. Mm -hmm. And you learn something new and you meet some new people, you know? Yeah. And it it human humanizes it as well. You know, when you're you're in a small place and it's like, well, these are the people, you know, it's, um, it's not these kind of, um, this infinite mass of people that you're working with. It's it's a small group, and you kind of and compromise leads often to these you know, limitations. Lead to some great work. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, it's uh, really interesting to hear your journey and sort of sort of background to some of this, um, some of your work, and and kind of where you're at today, uh, Taylor. And really appreciate you catching up with us. Um, from all the different corners of the world, I think this has been quite interesting to just I get, hear a little bit more of a background to the music and to the sound. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 definitely been um, uh, instructive as well to sort of hear your story about developing a community, something that Simon and myself are also very interested in. Um, and hopefully with the the bigger goal and you know creating work that inspires people to to think about things and to slow down a little bit. Thank you so much, Taylor. Yeah, thanks. It's yeah it's it's nice to connect with like you said with another part of the world if it has to be on zoom then you know that's what it has to be right now (laughs) we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day yeah it's been really enjoyable thanks all right thank you Taylor. i'll catch you again soon okay all right bye